Clark. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh, Lord. I praise your name. Oh, Lord, I magnify your name, Prince of Majestic is his name. And then be seated. Okay. All right. Keep it simple. You're not supposed to argue. Okay. Let's see. So we are going to recognize our seniors this year, our high school and our college seniors. So as I call your name, if you will come up front and line up, Paul's going to get pictures, and Julie's going to hand the gifts out. So we're going to start with our high school kiddos. Who's on that tag? This is Gideon. Gideon Hassan. <laughs> Gideon is graduating from the homeschool, Hassan Homeschool program. Um, he is attending Gordon Cooper for carpentry. High five. Okay, next up is Allie Mixon. Allie is graduating from McLeod and she will be attending OSU Landscape Architecture. Next up, my future daughter in law, Alethea Anderson. <laughs> Hey, speak into existence. <laughs> she is graduating from Shawnee, and she will be attending OBU. We're not sure what she's going to do for a living. Who knows? It's OK. She'll figure it out. And last but not least, little Miss Becca Hare. She is graduating from the Hare Homeschool Academy. She will also be attending OBU. Do we know what we're going to do when we? Grow up. She's going to be a nurse. Oh, English. English. My bad. Same thing. All right. So now we're going to move on to our college, oops, students. And first up is Miss Katie Harmon. Is she here today? I don't think so. Okay. Katie's not here? That's I okay. So, I don't think it has to Do we know? What? She did. Sure Next up is Emily Simpson. <laughs> Emily likes to tell everybody it only took her five years to graduate, so, and what are you doing? Oh, I'm doing social work. Social work. That, hey, that's, not, that's a big thing. Yes. <laughs> All right, next up we have Miss Kaylee Reynolds, soon to be Mrs. Zach. <laughs> And Kaylee, you're graduating with what degree? Communications. Communications. I have no idea what that means, but okay. <laughs> That's what I should have gone to college for. Next up, Tessa Potter? Tessa Potter. Okay, so she's not here this morning because she had a track meet last night and is sleeping. Josh Spears. What are you graduating, Josh? 
Oh, biology and pre-med. <laughs> Too smart for me. Oh, wait, you got to stand there. Also, just so everybody knows, um, the bags they are receiving, the women's ministry Miss Julie put together for them, they have a throw in them with Matthew 5.12 um, on them. 5.16, sorry. 5.16 on them. I was close. I was only off by a couple numbers. Zach Hill. Soon to be Mrs. Kaylee. Mr. Kaylee, sorry. Right? If you don't know, him and Kaylee are getting married in December, December 19th. They were our college students. We're going to miss them. Oh, and he's graduating with a degree in history. Oh, lovely Miss Gianna Hayes. Yay! Yay. She is actually graduating from OU with a degree in mass communications. Still, in, there you go, journalism. <laughs> and she's married to Andy. Yes, she just got a job in journalism as well. Um, what does that say, Alyssa? Alyssa Rogers. Biblical studies, that's amazing. And she'll be attending Southeastern Theological Seminary. That's great. Joshua White. Yeah, Josh and uh, Mallory, uh, they are not here. They have been isolated themselves due to COVID all summer. Uh -huh. Sure, bless their hearts. Uh -huh. They still stay in touch, and they'll be joined by Andrew Deal. And uh, so they also, they've been a big part of our program for a while. Perfect. So if you got one of these lovely bags, our seniors, would you? stand so you can be recognized one last time. Congratulations to all of you and good luck with your future. Um, inside the bag you'll also find a Jesus Calling book and there's been some scriptures written in the front of it and some other things. Uh, this morning as we were having service at 830, uh, Andy uh, referred to one of them was uh, Matthew 5 16 let your light shine and that's what we're relying on is that you rely we rely on you to let your light shine because you're our next generation you're our next generation for hope and your our hope is in you uh, in Christ but in you to fulfill what God's plan is for your life and we want that so much and I have your names written down in my book I'll be praying for you as well as this church will be praying for you to succeed. Because you've got to have that armor on. You've got to be in the fight. You've got, this is a spiritual battle. This is serious. And we're praying for you to fulfill that mission that God has for you. Thank you. Amen. All right. It's fun to celebrate life achievements going to read from Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 11 and 12, and then down to verse 19. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus Christ, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. These words are a good reminder for us at all times, but especially at times of transition. As high school seniors, college seniors, as you move on from here and out into the world, approach the throne of grace with confidence and do not give up the habit of meeting together. Wherever your journeys take you, find yourself a new church home. Plug in, be involved, keep following and worshiping God. Let's pray. Amen. Father God, we do thank you, Lord, the privilege we have of approaching your throne of grace 
Lord, not needing the mediation of any priest, offering doves or goats or lambs, but that, Lord, you are the lamb offered once for all, for all sin. Thank you that we can approach your throne with confidence. Thank you that we can gather together to worship, to glorify you. Lord, may you be honored by the worship that we offer up to you this morning. May it be a sacrifice of praise pleasing to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Y'all stand with us. This is many people's favorite hymn. It's certainly one of mine, followed by another of my favorites. It is well with my soul. Is anybody going to run the computer there, Pastor? When peace like a
seated. Hey, Brother Andy. Pray for the Lord. Hey, Amen. Amen. So, oops, sorry, brother. I think I just walked up here out of habit this morning. <laughs> sorry. No, I get to share the prayer request this morning. I'm thankful to do that. Andy's been doing such an a Andy's been doing such an amazing job of sharing our prayer requests with us. Thank you, Andy. But he's preaching this morning, so he's going to be our first prayer request today. Andy, you've been doing a great job. Thank you. We need to be aware of who needs prayed for. We get to find that out. We pray. Wait, God, wait for God to answer, and that's what we do here. And thank you guys so much for that. Pray for Andy today. Pray also for that group of seniors. Pray for Andy that he's got a senior for a wife because that's pretty cool. <laughs> Man, what a group of young people we just got to look at up here this morning and Amen. their future. And, and, and Julie, Julie said so much. Man, we need to pray. Can you remember when you were a senior of high school or college or anything? I'm starting to see what the other part of the senior is about. But, man, all the, all the questions, all the thought, all the decisions. And that was just in the world, you know, and the things we got to do around this place. But think about how tough it gets spiritually. And uh, let's pray for those guys. Pray for them. Let's be their prayer support as they graduate and they move on out there into the world to be solid Christians in this world for us. We want to pray for them. You also please pray for Glenda. Glenda, this Thursday, she's going to have some surgery, and it's going, they're going to put a stent in her leg, and we want to pray for her. It's going to be uh, something that she needs, and we want to pray that that would go very well for, for Glenda. And the same day, Betty McAllister is going to, be having that knee operated on so we sure want to pray for him Chrissy has an uncle uncle Stewart that's up in the hospital in Oklahoma City that had a, a stroke and 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 her uncle Stewart he, he's not doing real well we we would love we, we all need to be praying for her uncle uh, in this time when he's trying to recover from a stroke and what kind of uh, what's next for him so please help help their family pray Pray for little, little Benjamin, Benny's little grandson. Benjamin, man, he made a few trips to the ER this week. He's been a sick little guy, and yesterday they kept him, and, and he had a high, high fever. He had a type of a seizure, and, and they kept him, and they, they began to give him some uh, IV fluids and some uh, antibiotics, and they got him to a place, got his fever down, and let him go home, but he needs to do some follow-up here to find out where all that came from. He was a sick little guy and all you had to do was listen to Benny tell you about him and you could find out how hard it was because Benny loves that little guy so pray for them um, we also need to pray for Gerald uh, Bells he's going to be having some eye surgery uh, this week we want to lift him up in prayer and Sherry Dunlap just had I I'm trying to think of all the details RJ but I know there was a, a head-on collision uh, with a former student of hers that she has asked us to pray. His name is Jer Jeremy, and we just want to we want to pray for that situation, whatever whatever that is. Sherry asked us to pray, and we need to pray. What a service has already got started here. I'm excited to be here today. I know you are too. Bow with me, and let's let's uh, welcome the Lord in here, and let's honor His presence. God, thank you for just being able to sing about how. God, we have this place. We have this place as Christians, deep down in our spirit, deep down in our heart, where no matter what is going on in this crazy world and within our families and all the heart and heartache, there's a place that we can be well in our souls. It can be well in our soul. And I thank you, Jesus, for how deep that is. Thank you that we got to sing about that today. And yes, that is a very favorite hymn of a lot of people and it's probably because of that very reason Lord Jesus and man Lord haste the day that those clouds open up and that trumpet sounds and then we get to know we get to know face to face Jesus until then thank you for the privilege of having a powerful church family and all that goes on in this place and thank you God for a prayer list where we can pray 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 for each other and maybe we don't think that the prayers are getting through sometimes. Maybe, maybe we have, uh, we, we just don't feel heard. God, please, with your spirit, let us know if that's not the case. God, you're there. You're there. And when we pray, it makes a difference. And today, 
right now as you look down, you're seeing a lot of hearts join together to pray, and it's making a difference. So thank you, Jesus. Pray for Andy this morning as he gets ready to, to share your word with us. How important your word is. Lord, according to Scripture, according to Scripture. I love that line. Thank you. And God, I pray, thank you for Dave and the leadership up here as we just walk into a worshipful place, ready to sing and lift up the name of the Lord Jesus. God, please take the names on our prayer list. And let the Spirit share with them in a way to know they're loved and cared for. And what other hands would you rather be in than the hands of, of the Lord Jesus? Jesus, it's in your name that we all pray here together. Amen. 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 Sing us with us real quietly. You ready? Here we go. Jesus, come in and adore you. We give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory this morning. I just lift up my sister Paula to you and, and uh, sister Ruth as they come to bring their gift of music to you, Lord. It's in the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And this song is Start again. The song is not about Paula, and the music's not about me, uh, and yet it is about Paula and me and each one of you. After this year of pandemic, we have let our hearts and our souls become weary and numb, and I pray that the Father would bring us back into his presence. Thing that 
you can do I just want you I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry when I just sang another song take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything And more than anything that you can do I just want you I just want you and nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you and nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. And nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, and nothing else, and nothing else, Jesus, nothing else will do. I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything And more than anything that you can do I just want you Good morning. We are going to be continuing our series through the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. So if you'll open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, we're going to be. The, oh, yeah, there's Children's Church. As Children's Church director, you think I would remember that, but there's Children's Church today. Yeah. That's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, 
And we're going to be looking at verse 9 today. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. More than, more than anything else in our world today, with this hectic world that we live in, ever-changing, spinning faster and faster every day, especially with this year that we just came out of, with the virus and the riots and protests and wars, depression, anxiety, stress, the one thing people are seeking more than anything nowadays is peace. We all just want peace. This peace we know comes from one source alone, from God, from God our Heavenly Father, that when we see a broken world, that when we see a world that it just seems like there's nothing that is in his right place, we know that we can turn to God for peace. And peace, when harnessed properly, can be a powerful weapon. It seems counterintuitive, or it seems almost like an oxymoron that peace could be a weapon. But it's a powerful weapon if harnessed properly in our lives and in our churches. I began thinking about the spiritual disciplines, and one of them is silent solitude. I don't know if any of you guys practice this, but it's where after you've prayed, and after you've read your Bible or whatever, you just sit and you just think on the ways that God is working in your lives. And just sit in that moment of peace thinking about that verse, be still and know that I am God. I really suggest injecting that into your spiritual life if you don't do that already. Um, just a moment every day of just sitting and thinking about God in your life. And recently I heard a story about something going on right now in the life of a pastor named Robbie Gallaty. I don't know if you guys know who Robbie Gallaty is. He pastors a fairly large church over in Tennessee. He spoke at OBU a couple times, but... Um, about a year ago, Robbie was just sitting and praying, and he realized that he was so go, go, go in his life that he'd left God far behind. That he was still following God, but he was running at his own pace and conquering his own battles, forgetting to look to the person who allows him to do those things, God. Forgetting to run with God hand in hand. So he took one evening, he just decided to go out onto his porch and just sit and listen to God's voice. Whatever God would bring for him, he would listen. And he made this a practice in his prayer time every single day to just sit in silence. This started about a year ago, and today we're seeing the fruits of that practice in his life. The Lord began blessing his ministry more than ever before. And he has a fairly large church, I'm not going to lie, but the Lord has started blessing his ministry more than ever before. There were points, there have been Sunday mornings, where Robbie's church has brought dozens of people to salvation and baptism. Just since January, Robbie's church has baptized 1,000 people. Amen. Since January, 1,000 people, and counseled those people into becoming stronger disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I heard a story of another pastor, Ed Newton, pastor of a church in Houston, who heard about this, so he just tweeted out one day, Hey, this is what's going on in Robbie Gallaty's church. If you guys want to come this morning and be baptized, we'll baptize you. And just this past Sunday, Robbie, or Ed's church baptized over 200 people. Man. Revival is happening in our churches today. Not some far-off land, not decades ago, but today, in 2021. And I don't want to say there's one exact cause to this, Obviously, both of these guys have had a relationship with God for a long time, are very strong spiritually, but I don't want to downplay the power and the magnitude that peace can have in our ministries, in our lives, in our hearts, if we would just simply seek peace. It seems counterintuitive to slow down and seek peace and to see such growth in that, such excitement, explosive growth through just the slowing down and seeking peace. But we're told in this passage today, Jesus tells us that there are fruits for employing peace in our lives. Being a peacemaker has fruits in our lives. First, Jesus tells us to be peacemakers, and then he points to two results of that peacemaking. So today, I want you to see that as peacemakers, we demonstrate the peace of God to the outside world, and we are called sons of God. As peacemakers, we reflect peace to the outside world, and we're called sons of God. So again, the verse says, 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The first result, or the first thing I want you to see before we look at the results, is what is peacemaking? And I want you to see that ultimately peacemaking is about a balancing act. We know what peace is. Peace is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Paul says that against those fruits there's no law in existence. And we often forget about of the Spirit part, but it's a gift from the Holy Spirit given to us. Peace is a gift to us. Peace, when found in the Bible, is ultimately just about sitting still and remembering the ways that the Lord has worked in your life. Just remembering those promises, remembering that God is the great promise fulfiller, and he has been working in our lives to just sit and think on how he works. We also see peace in Christ, that in his death and resurrection, he has given us the greatest gift, a salvation that can never be stripped away from us, an eternal inheritance stashed away for us in heaven. We can have great peace in this. When we think of a God who works all things out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes, how can we not find peace in that kind of a relationship? We see other religions, especially Eastern religions, want to tell you that peace is found through emptying your mind, through stripping away everything and just not thinking about anything, through intense meditation practices or different plants or medicines. However, for a Christian, peace is not found in emptying your mind. It's found in filling it. Filling it with reminders that the Lord is good. Filling it with reminders of how the Lord has been working in our lives, and peace is found in this. We all know what peace is. It's something we value. It's something we strive for. But I think peacemaking, on the other hand, often has a few misconceptions. I told this joke earlier, and nobody laughed, so maybe you guys will laugh. When I think of the practice of peacemaking, the first thing, ironically, that always pops in my head is the gun, which is a, I mean, that's good marketing right there. The first thing I always think of when I think of peacemaking is the peacemaker gun. But the other thing, the next thing I think of is another misconception that we often have surrounding peacemaking of just the passive guy who's just going to go in there and fix the situation. I think of the stepdad who walks into this room and catches his two rascals fighting, and he says, now, Timmy... You say something nice about Jimmy and go over there and give him a big old hug. And they don't listen to him. They hug and then maybe fight when he leaves the room. <laughs> Peacemaking is not like this. It's not silly. It's powerful. It's powerful. Yeah. It's about realizing the peace of God resides within us and faithfully pouring that out on the people surrounding us. While the world will tell you that the solution to peace is money or power or fame. We know that it resides within us because God has given it to us. Yeah. The world will tell you, respond to hostility with more hostility and hatred with more hatred. We know that we as Christians are to bring peace to conflicts. Yeah. We see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul refers to God as the Lord of peace. God himself ultimately is the one who authors and perfects peace within us. And we should respond to that peace by pouring it out onto the people around us. And we see later in Romans 12, 18, Paul says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. And in the next verse, 12, 19, Paul contrasts peace with wrath and vengeance, reminding us that wrath and vengeance are the tools of God and God alone, and we are not God. We see in Psalm 34, 14, David says, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. We should be peacemakers, bestowing peace on everyone around us. Vengeance and God, or vengeance and wrath, are the tools of God, not our tools. Our go-to should be peace. Because vengeance and wrath are fires. And playing with fire is dangerous. We should leave that stuff to God who knows how to handle those tools perfectly. We don't, so we should rely on peace. Yeah. However, I want to make it clear what peacemaking is not. There's two ends of the spectrum, and in the middle we find peacemaking. One of the end of the spectrum is that Christian peacemaker who says, I'm going to step into every situation with a cry of, hold on guys, I can handle it, I'm a peacemaker. I've got this. 
And the other end of the spectrum is the, oh, well, I don't know if I should talk to them about that. I'm a peacemaker. I wouldn't want to not make the peace. But we see a perfect balance in the middle. Peacemaking is about finding that balance between correction and comfort, between admonishing and assuring. And we see the perfect example of this in Jesus Christ. In so many situations, he handles it exactly as we think of peacemaking. He's always the perfect peacemaker, but we often think of the ones where he goes to the traditional method. When the Pharisees questioned him, he stood by the truth, but he responded coolly and calmly and told them, no, you're wrong, and you're heretics. But he does so coolly. Or when the Pharisees so often desired to kill Jesus, he would just slip through the crowd, disappearing into thin air. However, Christ is still the perfect peacemaker when he makes peace in ways that we don't expect. When he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan, Christ is still the perfect peacemaker. When he fashions a whip and charges those money changers out of the temple, Christ is still the perfect peacemaker. The cause for unrest in the temple that day was not this crazy guy driving him out with a whip, but it was the years of injustice against the people of God that these money changers were committing. And Christ says, I'll be the peacemaker, I'll set it straight. The cause for unrest, when Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan, is not Jesus calling somebody Satan. But it's Peter who denies that Christ is meant to die. He says, no, Lord, you will never die. And Jesus creates the peace again, setting the record straight. But this is where we have to be cautious. That first picture of peacemaking, the calm, cool, collected, is pretty tame. We can go safely with that. Sometimes when we get into the second half of peacemaking, the setting the record straight, is where we're really playing with something that we got to be cautious with. I want you to listen to these words on conflict resolution that Paul gives in Galatians chapter 6. He starts in verse 1 and he says, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespasses, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so that you too will not be tempted. We see in this text two qualifications for the peacemaker, for the resolver of the conflict. Gentleness and spirituality. Gentleness and spirituality. That the person going to resolve the conflict should be gentle and in tune with the will of God. Yeah. We're supposed to approach these conflicts with gentleness first and foremost, sternness coming later. Jesus sets this model in Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 15. Jesus says, If your brother sins, go to him and show him his fault in private. That's pretty gentle so far. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouths of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. Still pretty gentle. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, this is where the sternness comes in. Let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. We see the biblical model for peacemaking is this, finding the balance between gentleness and sternness, but in both approaching this with a place of having God's will in heart. Gentleness, 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 all the way down the line until we come to that moment where we have to be stern. This is the job of a peacemaker. And we see, in Galatians chapter 6, two qualifications, gentle and spiritual. So who handles the situation? We're all called to be peacemakers. If there's a situation where only you know about it and you're the only peacemaker present, be the peacemaker. But what if there are multiple candidates for the job? What if there's a couple peacemakers present? Hopefully, if we're dealing with something within the church, there'll be plenty to step up. But who goes and makes the peace? Who makes that first step? The gentle ones, the spiritual ones. We should be leading with gentleness. Is the first person the church member of 40 years because they've been here the longest? Not necessarily. Maybe, maybe not. Is it the elder or the deacon? Maybe, maybe not. Whoever we send, it can be any of these people, or even church members that we wouldn't expect, whoever we send, they have to be going in a, 
in an attitude of gentleness and spirituality. Gentleness and spirituality. With the ability to go to sternness when necessary. As long as whoever we send is gentle, spiritually mature, in tune with the will of God, and ready to take the next step if it comes down to it, we're good. That's how we handle conflict. That's peacemaking. So church, your role is to not be all gung-ho, I'll tackle the situation, I got it, I'm on it. But you're also not to just sit there twiddling your thumbs either. We're called to find that balance. We're called to find the balance between the gentleness and the sternness. To be advocating for the peace of God in whatever situations are possible. And we see in the text today two results of that peacemaking. The first one is that peacemaking bears witness of God to the world. Peacemaking bears witness of God to the world. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We'll get to the sons of God part soon, but first I just want to tackle, for they will be called. Whatever we do as a church, whatever we think, whatever we say, in whatever attitude we carry ourselves, we're going to be called something. Everyone is watching you. Whether we advocate for God properly or not, we're going to be called something. So the first thing we see is that our peacemaking has an impact on the outside world. Interestingly, when you look at the list of the Beatitudes, there are some that are pretty controversial to the outside world, and there's some that are pretty tame. To the average Joe out there, peacemaking is one of the least controversial ones. No one wants to be mourning or poor in spirit or blessed when they're under persecution. But everyone says, yeah, I want some of that peacemaking. That's just being a good person. Peacemaking is just good. However, so often what the world is calling us is not sons of God but probably something that I can't repeat behind the pulpit. Often the exact opposite. When we hear criticisms about the church, we know what they are. We've heard them a million times. We've heard this before. Those people are hypocrites. They're judgmental. They hate me. They'll shove the Bible down your throat. If they were just more peaceable, I would be able to stand them. A lack of peacemaking in the church is one of the first things that an outsider notices. When there's conflict within ourselves, when there's gossip within ourselves, that's the first thing an outsider notices. How shameful it is. How shameful it is that one of the cliches of the church is split over the carpet color. That is a shame and a disgrace to God. This doesn't mean that we compromise on doctrine, that we get up, give up what we believe, and we just change how we do things because the world pressures us to. But when we're peacemakers, truly peacemakers, the outside world will see it. Whether they recognize it or not is a different story. Whether they follow it or not is a different story, but we know that they will see it. Right. So knowing this, peacemaking serves as a great witness to the outside world of who our God is. Amen. It stands above the world's way of doing things, about selfishness, about doing whatever it takes to get above in every situation. As peacemakers, we demonstrate God to the outside world. I think of Isaiah 26, 3, where he says, The steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts you. We stand as ambassadors for God, the Lord of peace, and therefore are called to reflect all of his attributes in our lives, including peacemaking. When we're peacemakers, we're not just benefiting ourselves. We're reaching out to a lost and dying world who has the opportunity to know and come to God through our peacemaking. The best reason, the best reason to practice peacemaking is this. We bring glory to God the Father. We bring glory to God the Father. That when the outside world is clamoring for, clamoring for an answer to their problems, and they look at you, and you show them nothing but the peace that God can provide, how great of a witness that is to our wonderful God. Yes. It reminds me of Jesus later in the Sermon on the Mount. He says in Matthew 5, 14, You are a light to the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on the lampstand, and it gives light to all those who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. 
The human eye is naturally drawn to light. I read something interesting in researching for this sermon that we can see a single candle, if it were pitch black in perfect conditions, we can see a single candle a mile and a half away. A mile and a half that we can see. If what we emit is light, the outside world will always see it. They may not follow it, they may not recognize it, but they can't help but see light in you. So emit that light. Be the peacemaker. What better reason than to think of an outside world who is facing the wrath of God if they do not come to him, that sees us as judgmental, hypocritical, hateful, hostile. What better reason to reach out to them and be the peacemaker? That we're dealing with a lost and dying world. This is serious. This is life and death we're talking about. Be the peacemaker. Finally, we see peacemaker, peacemaking is intrinsically tied to being a son of God. We know what the world thinks of us. We've talked about that. What matters really is what God thinks of us. And when he sees us as true peacemakers, he calls us his sons and his daughters. The world may call us anything under the sun, but God knows our hearts truly. We have a responsibility to be a peacemaker. We know that we're already a co-heir with Christ, that his blood has saved us. I don't want it to make it sound like any work, including peacemaking, is what saves you. Paul says in Romans 8, 17, And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. So we are already co-heirs. Peacemaking doesn't make you that. But rather, as a son of God, as a daughter of God, as a child of the king, we should have a desire to reach out and be a peacemaker. And the greatest inspiration for us is the cross. That we were God's enemies. That we were the exact opposite of peacemakers. That we rebelled against him every single day, walking further and further into darkness every single day, and Jesus reached out with the perfect olive branch, the perfect act of peacemaking, justifying us, justifying us through his blood. Amen. What greater source of peacemaking do we have? And as a response, we should think on these things. Think about that measure of peacemaking to the utmost that Christ has given you and give that to other people. That while the world will tell you to respond with hostility and enmity and hatred, as Jesus Christ had the right to with what we've done. But he reaches out to you in perfect peacemaking. 1 Peter chapter 2, 21, he says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges right, righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have been returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. This is the measure of peace that Christ has bestowed on us. That just as the prophecy said, he didn't utter one single word in defense of himself. He didn't make an argument. He didn't fight back. Even to his dying breath, when he says on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus is the perfect peacemaker. Amen. What better reason do we have than to reach out to others in peace as well? We've experienced as children of God the greatest measure of peacemaking. Peacemaking to the utmost degree. How could we not respond with peacemaking of our own? So I want to challenge you today, church, to think about what side of the spectrum you're on. Me, personally, I'm on the passive side. I really don't want to get into situations if I don't have to. 
But so many of us are on this other side. I'll be the peacemaker. It's me. I've got it. Think about that perfect balance that Christ strikes. And our motivation for that should be that Christ has given us the greatest act of peacemaking anyone has ever experienced. Shedding his own perfect blood, for the scriptures tell us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And reaching out to you, an enemy of himself, a child of darkness and wickedness, and bringing you to his house and saying, now you are a child of the king. I want you to think about that gift as we pray. And dear Lord, we know that you have given us everything. That you have given us something greater than we could ever explain or understand. That we're called your children, God, because of that perfect act of peacemaking on the cross. God, I pray that we would be inspired by that this week. That we would do our part to reach out to the people around us and be peacemakers as well. Knowing that it brings you such pleasure and glory to see your child acting as you have. God, I pray that you would illuminate our hearts, God. That we would look to you knowing that we all, in one way or another, fall on one side of that spectrum. And we thank you for the perfect example of striking the balance in peacemaking. We pray that we would look to you, God, that we would be filled with gentleness and spirituality, that when we do have to make that tough move to reach out to the people in our lives who have sinned, that we would follow your model, God. We love you. We thank you for the cross. It's in your name we pray. Amen.